Welcome to Vision 2021. If we haven't met, I'm Levi. Usually at this time of year, our family would be hitting the open road with the Tim Hortons coffee in hand as we traveled across Alberta and Saskatchewan, looking forward to meeting and seeing each one of you as we shared about the things that God was doing. And yet, here we are. What a year it has been. I'm sure for all of us, 2020 was not the year we planned for, and it was definitely not the year we hoped for. But praise God, we serve a king who is the king of kings, and he is still on his throne today, and he is at work in the lives of many, even amidst a very difficult year. And so why don't you come along as we share about what God has done, about what God is doing, and as we look forward in faith at what God might do in the year of 2021. But first, let's take a trip down memory lane as we look back at what ministry used to look like for Child Evangelism Fellowship and you be David and I'll be Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. So I'll just take you into my first office. And uh, my first office was, was this room. It was just off our kitchen. And uh, ultimately I would, I would sit here at a desk and Tyler, when he was working with us, he would sit here. And uh, on top of that, we would have a printer in here and uh, do all our printing. And it just got to a point where we thought, this isn't gonna work anymore. So through discussions with Sharon and that, we wondered, can we move it into the basement? What's our options? And, one night Sharon said to me, I think what you need to do is you're going to have to move your office over into the sunroom, which was some of our family space, but uh, it came to the point we thought, you know what, maybe that's what we need to do. And so just off the kitchen, uh, this was our sunroom, and Levi had finished this room off. This room was surrounded with desks. Uh, Tyler sat here and this was his desk. It went around here with some other desk and I sat here in this corner and it went around and Levi sat right about here and that was his desk. And then when Kristen, especially during the summer when things were extremely busy, uh, Kristen would come and she would try and fit in here as well, uh, which wasn't great but all four of us could be found working in here, especially in the summer. But virtually every day, this was our office, and this is where we spent most of our time. Oh, there's my mom, just like always. Oh, nice to see you. So anyway, this is 74. This is my mom, Melba. And uh, they have been uh, involved with the ministry since 1957. Hard to believe how many years that's been. But 74 was the office for over 40 years. Uh, truly amazing. Today, uh, there's some lessons that are still coming in to, to 74. And we would open it up and we would get the response from the, the children. And uh, as the children we'd reach would send in their lessons. And uh, every day we would, we would be looking through the mail to see uh, what has come in. Then uh, the office here was over uh, just in the garage. And uh, in a strange way, uh, when mom and dad moved here in 79, I wasn't even married. Um, and the office was, garage was used as an office. And, and actually, they, for 40 years, they never parked a car in, in the garage. It was always an office. And uh, it has been converted back to uh, a garage uh, just within the last year. But uh, this was our office. You can still see some of the the slat wall is still on the wall and uh, we had shelving in here all around the perimeter the garage door was covered over with uh, uh, more shelving and display fixtures uh, there was actually a, a, a staircase that dropped down from the ceiling and the whole area above the garage was used for storing uh, the summer missionary suitcases 
um, materials for the five day clubs, mailbox club lessons. And then right where I'm standing, there was another 12 foot shelving unit uh, right to the ceiling. And on the one side we had our, our visuals and then on the back side was actually shelving for all the mailbox club lessons and uh, the books that we would send out to the kids. We just thought we'd like to give you a little glimpse and give you a better idea of what God has done. And uh, now we'd like to take you to Seti. Well, here we are at 707 Prairie Avenue in Sedley, Saskatchewan. It's uh, kind of a crazy story how we got here. And uh, I guess uh, tonight we just wanted to give you a little bit of the backstory of, of how this all happened. I, uh, I guess the big thing is we, we needed space. And uh, we showed you a little bit about 83 and 74 and and uh, the ministry was just kind of overtaking our, our home. And uh, I don't know, Sharon probably has, would have a lot more to say about losing <laughs> space than, uh, than I would. I, I just kind of did whatever needed to happen, but uh, usually at her expense in the home. Well, uh, I used to joke that I'd like to run away from home. And uh, <laughs> I, I did, we were reaching the point of desperation. Um, we were out of options, and we just needed to see God provide an answer. But we desperately did not want to go ahead on our own. We wanted God to do it and to know that he did it. So, yeah, we waited on him. There's kind of some very significant things that happened over the last couple decades at least that probably we didn't realize how significant they were until about a year ago. And uh, one of those things that was absolutely essential to any of this happening was something that happened in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, it was uh, back in 1995 that uh, a, a church, a, a small church in Calgary, um, called Faith Chapel, decided that they wanted to donate their church building to the ministry of David and Jonathan. They had seen what was happening. They uh, were already a kind of a part of the ministry, um, marking lessons and helping getting mailing out. And they wondered whether or not David and Jonathan would be interested in Faith Chapel donating their church building to the ministry of David and Jonathan. Well. I remember dad, he, he could not believe that this opportunity had come and um, we actually have the, the address and this was the address of, of Faith Chapel and, and the, the home of the David and Jonathan ministry for, uh, in Calgary. And um, it was, uh, I guess, that decision that really facilitated uh, which we had no clue about at the time, and, and we operated ministry-wise out of Calgary, um, sending lessons out to Alberta and BC and even Ontario and other parts of Canada. Uh, we were also operating in out of Regina, uh, sending out the lessons for uh, a large part of Saskatchewan and, and beyond. Um, one thing that happened back in the spring of 2019 is we decided to, that we needed to amalgamate and just to save overhead costs. And um, 
I remember kind of talking about, I was talking to the Calgary office about it and just the need to bring everything under one roof to save costs. And uh, I know I'd, I'd told Sharon that I, th I think we need to do this. And she said... <laughs> Where are you going to put all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, me, I, I wasn't thinking too much about worrying about that. I just... I just He's the eternal optimist. <laughs> I thought, well, there's not that much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it turned out there was a lot more stuff than I thought. And, uh, but we had already just started those discussions. And another thing that happened in um, 2019, um, Sharon's dad passed away. And uh, we ended up, he passed away August 27th. And we ended up having the funeral in September, actually on September 6th, I believe it was. And uh, anyway, we were there for the funeral and celebrating his life. And on September 7th, we went out for lunch with Sharon's mom and, and a bit of family. And um, all of a sudden we got this, the kids had gone back early and, and Sheena sent me a text uh, and a message, and uh, this was now on, on September 7th, and she's like, Dad, this one's crazy. 12,000 square feet in Sedley. And then she sent the link to the, to the advertising, real estate advertising of, of 707 Prairie Avenue, and, and we're scrolling through the pictures here at Denny's Restaurant in Brooks, Alberta, and we were like, wow, that, that is crazy. And kind of flipped through the pictures and put, put my phone down and uh, didn't really give it much more thought. And then we were on our way, way back home on the next day, the 8th of September, and Sharon and I were traveling alone and I, I just said, doesn't cost to look. We could go and look and we've known in the past, we've, we had looked at a couple other places, but I just, I thought we could look. It's, it's free to look. And Sharon, one thing she had, she'd always said that, you know, she talked about us not having time. Well, I had three things that I had kind of talked to the Lord about, and uh, one was that whatever his answer was for us, um, anytime I'd go on the internet and try to look for something, I'd get anxious, and I just felt like, okay, God, whatever your answer is, um, if you have an answer other than where we are, you're going to have to drop it in our laps because to go looking would be a huge distraction from um, doing what we need to do. The other thing was we had talked about adding on to our house, but just the, the immensity of that project was overwhelming. And I thought another thing was, Lord, we just we, we could get so distracted with a building project. And so that just, you know, that whatever you have, it can't be such an immense project that we get consumed by that. And then the third thing was uh, no debt. Uh, we don't want to go into debt at this stage of our lives, nor did we want the ministries to go into debt, and because uh, that could finish off, again, hinder what? Um, we could do ministry-wise. So those were my three main things that I'd talked to the Lord about. So so then I thought, well, we're tra we were traveling back on uh, Sunday, I believe it was, and, and I, you know, I said, well, we could go have a look. And then uh, I thought, well, well, I'll talk to them on, on Monday and maybe we can go look on Tuesday, which would have been the 10th. And then I forget, one of the kids said, well, why would we wait? Why, why can't we look tomorrow, which is Monday? And I'm like, well, I guess there isn't really a good reason. So we, we contacted the real estate and we said, you know, uh, he was a Christian young man and, and uh, we said, you know, we'd be interested in looking at this property out at Sedley. And uh, so before we knew it, September 9th, 
we were out here at Sedley. And uh, over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to give you a glimpse of what we saw. Another strange thing happened. So we got back September 9th, we just got back to the house and, and I got an email on my phone. And uh, the email, it didn't tell me who it was from, but it was titled, um, I b believe this is your philosophy. And I'm like, I didn't know if it was spam or what it was. And anyway, I looked at it and it, it was titled Faith Gets a Contract. And I, uh, I thought, wow. And I read it and it, it wasn't a long email, but it said, it said this, it says, when God is going to do something wonderful, he begins with the difficulty. And if it's going to be something very wonderful, he begins with an impossibility. And if the Lord has a gigantic task to be performed, faith gets a contract. And I'm like, wow. And then at the end, this person wrote, I'm sure you have situations at present that would fit this challenge. I'm like, who in the world sent this? And I had no clue they didn't put their name. And so I, I checked the email address that it came from and I searched my emails and here it was Lois Sutcliffe from down in Estevan. Whatever prompted her to send that that night could have been nothing but God. And it was crazy because just a matter of months later, Lois would pass away and I actually, I actually uh, gave a, a message at her funeral. And again, it was like these things were all coming together and it was like, could this be God's answer uh, to our need? Um, well, the owner of the property was asking 749000 which seemed like a bargain for anything in the city. But uh, we didn't have 749000 But what we did have was we had this property in Calgary. And we had, we had talked about amalgamating and we had talked about um, wanting to you know, move things here, but we didn't know what we were gonna do with the property. We had rented it out to a church, uh, the upstairs portion for uh, probably 20 years to the same church. They were paying 500, maybe up to $600 a month, uh, basically to help us with the, the overhead costs of the utilities and that. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll tell you what, we, uh, first of all, if this is going to happen, we need to sell the property in Calgary. So I, uh, I contacted the pastor of the church and uh, I said, we're looking at buying a property and we're wondering, is there, would there be any interest in you buying the property here in Calgary? And uh, he was like, wow. He says, we've been trying to buy a property for years. As a matter of fact, just literally, uh, I think the week before, had he told well, him? A couple of days before. A couple of days before. He was like, we just tried to put an offer in our property and the city turned it down. They wouldn't zone it or something. And uh, they were very interested. So then I, uh, I said, well, um, we didn't know what it was worth. And I contacted a friend of ours in Calgary and I, I says, could you go buy this property, 2115? Uh, Fifth Avenue Northwest and, and tell me what you think. He got back to me the next day and he says, well, he says, I, I don't know, but he's in a very sought off area be, for developers because it's right close to downtown. And he said the lot that that church is sitting on is worth 720000 And uh, so we, again, just starting to see God's hand way back in the mid-90s to help facilitate this uh, through this church, Faith Chapel. And uh, I told, asked the pastor, I says, would you be interested in buying, buying the, the church for 720000 the, the value of the property? And uh, they said he would talk to the, the board, and they talked. And uh, I said, the one thing is we'd need this deal to go through on November 25th because we felt we needed to move at the 1st of December, and we needed the money from the church to pay for the property in Sedley. We put an offer in to the lady for 720000 on the condition of the sale of our property in Calgary, 
and uh, the property on Calgary sold to the church for 720. The lady got back to us said I can't sell it for 720. Uh, the other thing was is we needed we needed furniture. We had no furniture to fill this place. So we in our offer we'd asked for all the furniture, the riding lawnmower, the rototiller, everything. And she got back to us says we'll sell it to you for 735 and you can have everything. And uh, so by, I mean, as crazy as it is, uh, we moved in on December 2nd. In less than three months from seeing it, we were moved. And uh, so we just, uh, the property here is, is owned by David and Jonathan. Uh, the ministries of CF Saskatchewan and CF of Alberta operate from here. But this actual property is actually the property of David and Jonathan. And uh, that is why uh, you will see and uh, so December 2nd, things moved from Calgary, from Regina 74, Regina 83, and actually from Manitoba, another load and shipment came in from things stored there. That's a little bit of the background story, and uh, I'm thankful I have a wife that's been willing to kind of walk this road with us, and uh, it's been exciting to see what God has done. And so I trust you've been encouraged, and thank you for uh, joining us today as we share what God has done. If you spent any amount of time with my grandpa Durston Vaughn, he would often be heard saying, it's an amazing thing. And I can echo those words and saying, it truly is an amazing thing what God has done in his amazing provision for this ministry. Next up, we're gonna be hearing from Jerry and Sharon, my mom and dad, about life out in Sedley. So let's go inside. So first of all, what are your different roles in the ministries? And I'm going to start with mom or Sharon. I'm going to reference you as Sharon. I don't often get to do that. So please share your different roles in the ministries. Uh, well, I don't really have any official role with CEF. Um, I edit letters. My father-in-law would refer to people like me as a nitpicker. And so I find what's wrong. <laughs> and so if something's left and it's grammatically incorrect in a letter or something. That would be my fault because I'm kind of the last. Check. Or I rush through it and I never yeah, went to the editor. Sometimes he shows me the letter at 12 a.m. and my <laughs> eyes are like sandpaper at that point. So yeah, um, I, so I do that with CEF, with D&J. That's where I have a more active uh, official role, I guess. And that would be, my father-in-law would also call me a bean counter. And so I, yeah, keep track of the, the money in, the money out, that kind of thing. So bookkeeper, essentially. And uh, then I also um, have been working with the development of the Club DJ curriculum, specifically the student books and choosing curriculum and things like that. And uh, so this uh, last few years, I've had some help with that with Shaylee. And then this year, Kristen's also helping, as well as uh, another gal that did some volunteer prep work for us for next year. So, yeah, God has been faithful in providing help, and I'm thankful for that. So, yeah, I think that's basically it. I wear three hats. I am the Provincial Director of Child Evangelism Fellowship of Saskatchewan. I'm also the Provincial Director of Child Evangelism Fellowship of Alberta. And I am also the president of UB David and Albie Jonathan. And all three of those are separate charities. They all have separate T3010s from the government side. And so I wear multiple hats at multiple times. And uh, that changes what I'm doing from day to day sometimes. Now, on that note of you wearing multiple hats, um, I have heard you, you touched on it a little bit on some confusion between the different ministries. It gets a little confusing as it appears there's the same staff for all three ministries. Um, so is Club DJ, is it a ministry of child evangelism? Is Quizmeet, where does Quizmeet fall? Where do the mailbox club lessons fall? Um, so could you just please bring some clarity to those that are maybe just a little foggy on uh, the different ministries and how they correlate um, and what that looks like. Sure. Um, Child Evangelism Fellowship of Saskatchewan was um, a ministry that had a couple different components. One strong one that is still continues is the five-day clubs. 
uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, good news clubs were huge. And then uh, follow-up was something my father was, was very strong on. And so even when I was a young boy, I was doing mailbox club lessons. And even before mailbox club lessons were even a thing, we were using something called Traveler's Treasure Trails. Then uh, CF of Alberta and CF Saskatchewan, some people might think that's one ministry. It, it, actually, it isn't. Uh, both ministries are separate registered charities so that when uh, people support the ministry in Alberta, those funds stay in Alberta for the furtherance of the ministry there. Then David and Jonathan um, was an organization my father started and was actually a, became a registered charity in 1989. And the whole philosophy behind UB David and Abby Jonathan was to uh, disciple boys and girls through the mail with a, a follow-up program with awards and everything. That grew into being a, having an online presence. You might be familiar with ubdavid.org, which is under UB David and Albert Jonathan. Then my wife and I, back in the late 90s, developed Club DJ, which wasn't particularly a ministry that just stayed within the walls of, of Saskatchewan or Alberta. It actually has gone across Canada and into the States and even into other countries. And uh, so that also is under the umbrella of UB David and Abby Jonathan. And then about five, six years ago, we started Quiz Meet, which Bible quizzing program, which is also under UB David and Abby Jonathan. Again, not tied to any geographical area. And so uh, there is different hats, but there's definitely um, a strong connection between all the ministries. They work very well together. But that's why uh, some of you are connected through the UB David and Albie Jonathan ministry and some are connected to either CF of Alberta or Saskatchewan. And five day clubs, that would be a direct ministry of? That's direct ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship. Okay. And Excellent. runs during the summer months. And Club DJ is more the winter months and the school year. So it's in some ways, Club DJ has, has connected closer with the churches. We partner directly with churches, and we're very thankful for that. And that just is opening up more and more doors. So. Awesome. Now, I know uh, this past year of 2020, um, and I guess the tail end of 2019, brought a lot of changes, uh, specifically the move to Sedley. So can you tell me, I guess, what has it been like? You used to live in Regina, uh, and ministry used to operate out of Regina. What's it been like moving to small town and enjoy, as they would call, small town living? Oh, it's awesome. We both grew up on the farm, and we, uh, I guess, me personally, um, I was never 100% at home in the city, city life, and yearned for a quieter life. And so, yeah, it's wonderful as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we, we love living here. It's uh, We're looking out on onto fields off the back of the property and grain bins, and it's just almost the way it was when we grew up. So yeah, we, we just love this uh, living. Now, uh, you need to be careful with this question, considering I am your son, uh, but what's, what's it like working with family? It might be a, a marvel to some people, but I'm sure, but share a little bit of your perspective. Well, we're pretty real, and um, people say, oh, you have such an awesome family, which, yeah, we, we, we are grateful for our kids, and God's been good, but we do have moments, and there's been uh, door slamming sessions, things like that, so we're pretty real, <laughs> and, uh, but it is very exciting to see uh, our kids serving the Lord and just how God gifted each one uh, for the task that he has for them and very differently we don't expect one to be like the other they're all very unique and very gifted in different ways and if jerry and i were sort of running things just us it would be photocopied sheets of paper through a, a photocopier because we don't have all those skills so yeah i don't know yeah i all i would say is there's very few fathers that have the privilege of working with their kids and uh Throughout my life, that has probably been my biggest highlight and uh, blessing. Um, and to watch the giftedness, as Sharon said, in each one of our kids, it's, it's astounding. The kids he gave us and their gifts and talents, which I think, as we all understand our different abilities, the kids actually worked amazing together. 
and and uh, we fit in where we can. And, and even the vision of the ministry, really, it's getting more and more that we work collaboratively to, okay, how can we move forward? And it is just, I love working with my kids, and uh, I'm truly blessed. Um, some of the kids help in volunteer roles, and some are official staff. Yeah. But we thank God for each one and the role they play. Yeah. So. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a question for you, Jerry. How do you manage all the cleaning? I mean, this is an 18,000 square foot building. How do you manage amidst the three hats you wear? To yes, how this, do you do that? Clean yeah. this building. Well, it's amazing. I just, uh, I, it hasn't been a problem. Um, I just, I moved in here, my wife came with me, and it has worked out perfect. And uh, so as I'm busy with ministry things, uh, Sharon just kind of, takes care of things. And, um. <laughs> well, a more honest answer would be um, every woman that sees this place goes, how do you clean it? And uh, God's been gracious. My mom is living with us right now, and she really wanted to pay rent or something. And I said, no, mom, but what you could do is you could provide some cleaning for us. So we have a gal that lives just down the road. Actually, right? Sharon's mom gets up early and does the cleaning. <laughs> no, she does. <laughs> oh, so anyway, uh, the gal down the road, her name's Emanuela, and she comes and she yeah, works every week as much as she's able. And uh, so my mom underwrites that, and we're very grateful because it wasn't looking pretty a few months ago. <laughs> and she does an amazing job. She does an amazing, amazing job. job. Yeah. Now, we haven't got the tour of the building yet, um, just yet. But may I ask, how did everything, we're going to soon see just how much stuff, uh, whether that's materials or whether that's uh, lessons and all these different things, how did it all fit in 83? <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't, yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, yeah, we, we just, as the ministry kept growing, we just took over more and more house. It was, uh, we were starting to turn bedrooms into offices as the kids moved out. We, uh, um, I mean, we, if you saw our original office, which you, you'll see in a clip of the tour, we were in about a, well, Tyler and I were working in about a nine by nine square foot room, and then we moved into the sunroom, and then at busy times of year, everything spilled over. It went into the dining room, the living room, the front entry you could hardly walk into, the um, kitchen, I mean, I probably crossed the line when I started using the kitchen counter. Um, but uh, sometimes you had to do what you had to do. But not everything was in 83, so when we, when we moved into Sedley, it meant bringing everything under one roof. For over 40 years, uh, 74 uh, was the office of CF of Saskatchewan and David and Jonathan from 89 and there's a large garage probably at least a four-car garage including an attic space above with a drop-down staircase uh, that was plugged full our place was plugged uh, to overflowing we were actually using our garage for some of the craft work then we had a property in in Calgary which I uh, I've shared about but uh, or will be but they uh, that church then we emptied out that church that came to Sedley and then because we were so overstocked here we actually started storing things in Manitoba that were kind of uh, we were buying up printers we had large uh, volumes of Danny Orlis let's talk about books and those kind of things they we actually stored them at the farm in Manitoba because we just didn't have room anymore anywhere uh, we'd get a shipment of 5,000 Bibles the Heiden Bibles would come in and it was just it was like where do you put them and uh, so, yeah, moving things in here was amazing. Well, and I didn't always have the best attitude, and um, so I did a lot of repenting, and then, and working through that was a process, and yet I knew that God, you know, Jesus died for us, so couldn't I give up my house for him? And uh, so I kind of made it official. I did. I talked to the Lord often about it, but. Kind of the middle of August, I went forward in church, and just—I mean, nobody knew I would, why I was up there, uh, but it was—I just 
an act of obedience. Like, God, it's yours, even if nothing ever changes. And we remain in the situation we're in. Um, it's yours, and you can have my house. And uh, it was less than a month later, and God, uh, he's no man's debtor. And he has been beyond faithful and gracious. And uh, there were lots of ordinary days, and still are lots of ordinary days, but God just asks us to be faithful. And so he's been good, beyond good. Now, you've kind of touched on this already, but to, to finish things up here, how has this move to Sedley uh, impacted you both, not only in ministry, on the ministry front, but also just even from day-to-day -day life? Well, we, we had to sell our house that we raised our, we raised our family in. Um, a lot of memories, a lot of memories. Um, so we went from owning our home to renting. Uh, we rent here at Sedley from, from UB David and Abba Jonathan as they own the building. And so we pay rent to, to live here, which our rent basically uh, offsets and covers the utility costs for the ministry. So there's no cost to the ministries really for overhead costs. But uh, it's allowed us to expand. I don't even know how we would have done what we did this year. Like, people think, you know, in a situation like this year, like, there's nothing to do. We are so busy. <laughs> we have taken on things beyond what we could have ever done in 83. There isn't a chance we could have done the sponsor mailbox or the filming that we did for five-day clubs. And, and we've gotten more equipment. We, we've got a commercial paper cutter now. It is saving us hundreds and hundreds of dollars every month. Um, and so just the ability to expand, we're so excited about the opportunities. So. Well, and I think um, just seeing how God went before, he knew what we needed. If we had been really specific in our prayer requests for what we needed, we would have dreamed too small. And uh, just God knew how much space we'd need. And God also knew even the suites. Like I remember when we moved in here, I thought, well, why all these suites? Like what are they going to be used for? And you know, because we needed office space, so what's that about? And uh, yet this summer, to be able to have the summer missionaries, the four of them living here um, in their suites, they could do their own cooking, it just worked wonderfully, and then they could work with the ministry. And then when the shutdowns happened, I just remember saying, Lord, like, you didn't move us out here just to give us a nice, cushy place to live. Like, that isn't the point. And, uh, you know, just to see then that was, you know, as we, well, we can't run five day clubs, what can we do? And then just to see how everything unfolded with the sponsor mailbox and everything. And we just continually say to each other, there's no way, no way we could have done what has transpired this year out of Regina. And uh, then, you know, just even the, the desires of our heart, it would always been our desire to, if our parents needed us, that we could offer a place and uh, came to be that my mom needed needed a place this year and so God's been good even on the personal level to just um, enable us to do things that were on our heart for many many years so that's awesome well thank you both so much for uh, just getting I guess a glimpse into the day-to-day -day, um, you know and how what ministry looks like but also what just those day you know every days look like so thank you both thank you I hope that you enjoyed hearing a little bit of the behind the scenes of life and ministry here at Sedley. Next up, we're going to be hearing from my father, Jerry Durston, as he shares about what God has placed on his heart, and we trust that you might be encouraged. Well, it is a little unusual, but uh, I would like to welcome you to Vision 2021. I would have never dreamed that we would be meeting in this way uh, after the banquets last year. Over the next uh, four weekends uh, on Sunday evenings at 6.45, we are going to cover uh, four different challenges. Uh, the first one, an ordinary day. The second one, an unordinary way. The third one, hope for today. And the fourth one, a supernatural display. Tonight, I want us to look in God's Word in Exodus chapter 3. 
And uh, if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Exodus chapter 3. We're just going to look at the first four verses. And uh, it is uh, very familiar to most of us, but I'm going to read these first four verses. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Let's just have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for this opportunity to meet in this way. And I thank you for your people uh, spread out across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and across this nation. And I just pray that you will be, we'll be encouraged in the God whom we serve as we look into your word and uh, seek to apply something to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This past year has been anything but ordinary. But the or unordinary has become ordinary. Uh, words like lockdown, uh, isolation, quarantine. These are words that we wouldn't even have thought of, of talking about in January of 2020. All these words speak of separation. As we think back over this past year, it is amazing how the unordinary has become ordinary. And in some ways, this was true for Moses. In one sense, Moses, as a young man, would have been known as the prince of Egypt. And now we find him in this passage, he is taking care of sheep on the backside of the desert. These sheep weren't even his own. They were actually his father-in-law's, Jethro. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, when, when you would be caring for sheep, that that morning he decided to get up and take them to the backside of the desert. But it is interesting in our lives that God knows where we are. And God knew where Moses was, and he had not forgotten him. I think in this time that we're living in, there's many people wondering if, if God has forgotten them, if, if their families have forgotten them. All this business of isolation, separation, everything is, is not normal. And here we find in this passage that Moses has found himself on the backside of the desert, probably no one around except for the sheep, and... Uh, all of a sudden, on a very ordinary day, things changed. I think sometimes we forget whose we are. I want to read from you, for you from 1 Peter 2.9. And it says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I think in this past year, many of us ha have almost lost sight of that, of whose we are. It's interesting in here, it says that we are his own special people. And I guess as I think back uh, to this past year and the things that have transpired in, in ministry, I would have never dreamed when I was with you last year, just at the end of February, the first part of March, and, and the things I was sharing with you at Vision 2020, having no idea what laid ahead. And you know, it's, it's like that in life. We have very ordinary days. We have very ordinary days times and yet to God he is still sovereign and he is still in control if we look into verse 
2 of Exodus chapter 3, it says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Remember, Moses now is on the back side of the desert. And on the back side of the desert, God appears. God appears. You know, it is interesting with God. I don't know how much he thought about which bush he would use. But I actually believe with God that any bush will do. It actually says in here, a bush. Wasn't some sort of special bush, it was a bush. And God will do that in our lives as we seek to live our lives for Him. But the thing to remember that when God uses a bush, it will be extraordinary. Moses would never forget that bush. The question I have for you today is, when God appears, will he get your attention? You know, we go through our lives and we get up in the morning, and right now I don't think we expect anything unordinary to happen except for maybe the rules to change. But it is amazing how God, on a very ordinary day, can turn things right around in a very unordinary way. I remember back when I was at the bakery, I uh, went in very normally on a Saturday morning to make the donuts. I was working in the back, Sharon came with the kids, and we're picking up a few fresh goods for, for the day. And one of the kids came back to the back of the bakery and said, Dad, there's a man out front that wants to talk to you. And I went out front, and I'd never seen this gentleman before, and his first words to me were, God has sent me here to talk to you. And I didn't know what to say. It was unusual. And then he said, God's told me that you're going to go into ministry, and that ministry is going to reach a multitude of people. And I don't know where he got his information, but I I almost panicked. I'm thinking, how does he know? We were trying to sell the bakery, we wanted to go into ministry, and all of a sudden this guy walks into the front of the bakery and tells me this. And I panicked. I said, well, we're trying to sell the bakery and we want to go in. And he interrupted me and he says, you don't have to do anything. God's going to do it all. And in a strange way, it was a very ordinary day that became very unordinary. And I want to encourage you as you seek God in in your life and in this time when, when things seem to be all unraveled, that God is still on his throne, he's still doing things, and he still wants to impact our lives and those around us if we would just be willing and watching for him. As we look in verse 3, it says, Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? I don't know what our response would be to a burning bush. Would we, would we be just like, whoa, there's a, look at that, there's a burning bush, and not give it another thought? What is our response to a burning bush? What is our response when this gentleman walks into the bakery? Well, that's interesting. That guy's a little weird. I believe God will use circumstances and situations in our life to to mold us and make us into who he wants us to be. And every once in a while, there's going to be a burning bush. And any bush will do. The question is, will it get our attention? It's interesting in verse 4. It says, So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. You know, it was interesting, God didn't speak to Moses until he knew he had Moses' attention. I don't know if God's got your attention today. And if a burning bush, would you stop to look why that bush is not being consumed? It's because God was there. 
as we look at this, he is going to call us to see if we're listening. And today, I guess, I want to ask you, are, are you listening? If God showed up, whether it was at your place of work, whether it was in your neighborhood, whether it was at school, whether it was even at your church, if God showed up, would he get your attention? It's interesting what Moses' response was. Once God saw he got Moses' attention, Moses said, here I am. Here I am. You know, I guess uh, I think back to the day when we closed the bakery and we didn't actually sell it, we closed it. The day I took the letter down to the mall office to say that I was shutting the bakery down and I was going into ministry, Sharon phoned me from home. She says, you'll never guess what the devotional chart says in our, in our room. And she read me this. When they finally reach the shore, Peter's career as a fisherman is over. He leaves behind a business with a steady income, a business with assets, a business with a future. And without once looking back, without once taking inventory of his losses, what he gives up are boats, nets, and fish. And what he gains is Jesus. And that proved to be the best decision, business decision of his life. You know, it's interesting when God steps into our, our world and, and, and he appears in a burning bush or this man in the baker or, or whatever God uses, and he can use an endless amount of things. I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, 8 that says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. In Jeremiah 29, 11, which we're all familiar with, it says, For I know the thoughts or plans that I think towards you or have for you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I don't know if you're filled with a future and a hope. If, if, if today you're looking forward and you're saying, I am so excited about the future and the hope. And that's what we have through Christ Jesus. In Romans 15, 13, it says, And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I do not believe that in these days that God's people should be still in the backside of the desert, but rather we should, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 9, proclaim the praises of of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. As God's people in this time, in our nation, we should be such a beacon of hope and light drawing people to Jesus because they see there's something different in what we have. And that's why I'm excited about the ministry. No pandemic can slow that God down. It cannot stop him. He will go through doors, open doors, and close doors, and guide us and direct us in the ministries that he has called us to. The question is, will you say, here I am? I believe an ordinary day in an ordinary way can become an extraordinary day. Today, for those of you who are on the mailing list, we depending which mailing list you're on, we, we sent you a response form. Many of you have been connected and, and, and part of this ministry for, for many years. And in the nature of this uh, um, Vision 2021, I'm going to actually show three different response forms depending where you are and your connections. Uh, one is CF Saskatchewan. And there is a way there for you to respond as well as a CF Alberta, which you might have or a David and Jonathan response form. In many ways, these forms are much the same. You might say, this is the first time I've ever connected into a vision banquet, even though it's virtual. You might be willing to promote five-day clubs online in your neighborhood, as we are not even sure we're going to be able to be back on the ground this year. Would you pray for this ministry? You have received, if you're on our mailing, you've received our prayer card. And we love to have 
our prayer card on your fridge as a reminder to pray for this ministry. You could indicate on this form that you watched uh, Vision 2021 online. Um, and if so, which, which weeks did you, uh, were you a part of? Maybe you'd like to receive information on Club DJ, which will be featured as we go on through these weeks. Maybe you'd like to receive information on Quiz Me. Maybe you have a vehicle that you could donate to the ministry. You could contact us if you do. Or maybe you'd like to support this ministry financially. I am absolutely amazed over and over again how God will provide for the things that he is doing, provided that he gets the glory. And there's other projects. Um, through David and Jonathan, we've been uh, starting up club DJs in a Spanish-speaking country, south. And uh, you could sponsor uh, half a, a club DJ there for $600, a uh, full club DJ church for $1,200. And, uh, or you could be part of this building as we are going to be showing you through the virtual tour. I just want to thank you for being a part of this ministry and with us today. And uh, I hope that you can join us next week as we look into our, our challenge, which will be called an unordinary way. And that is usually how God does things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for the, the countless people that have been a part of this ministry for literally decades. And for those that are just finding out about it and, and wanting to be a part of what you're doing. And we just want to pray for your wisdom and discernment in these days and for your protection, that hedge of protection around us that will protect this ministry and protect those involved. And Lord, we just pray that this ministry will bring you honor and glory and that those that are reached and coming to Christ will be great joy in heaven as, they, as we hear the response of both boys and girls, young people and men and women giving their lives to Christ. And we do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we trust that you've been encouraged as you've heard from my dad, Jerry Durston, as he's shared from his heart. Now, before we let you go, what we've all been waiting for, uh, the beginning of the virtual tour of 707 Prairie Avenue. Well, welcome to 707 Prairie Avenue. We're glad you were able to finally come. Come on in. We're going to have a look around, and uh, this week we're going to show you the main floor. When we came, we, uh, we walked into the, the main room, uh, the living room, and uh, this is what we saw. Uh, this furniture, uh, for the most part, was all hers. And uh, she left the furniture here. And uh, we uh, were a little concerned about how we were going to replace her furniture. But uh, anyway, that's, a, that's another story. Then uh, after we walked in here, we saw this room. We went down, and, and we were... The first time we came, we're trying to figure out, is this something that would work for the ministry? And uh, we walked on down this way, and looking into this room here, she had a desk in here. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't this desk set up, but uh, this now is my office. And to give you a bit of perspective, uh, Tyler, Levi, and myself all worked in this footprint of deaths uh, back at 83. So it was a bit of an adjustment to be able to actually have a little more office space. Uh, we all have a printer in our, in our offices that we have been purchasing off oil companies that were shutting down, so we got them almost for nothing. Well, from my office, we'll just go down the hall here, and uh, there's two sets of stairs. One going down, which we're going to show you in two weeks. And next week, we're going to go up these stairs and show you the second floor. From here, we just go straight ahead. And this was the dining room. The dining room was also furnished. Um, this now is a table we had in the bakery. And a uh, big maple table from the bakery. But this was uh, formal dining. And then from the formal dining room, it has the fireplace. Uh, on the one side, which actually doubles up in the master suite. Then we'll go to the kitchen. 
the kitchen uh, just off the dining room. We were kind of amazed at uh, what had been done in the kitchen. We haven't done a thing in here. This is the way it was when we came. Uh, there's a commercial gas stove and hood. Uh, all the cupboards were in place. There, uh, again, windows all around the property just really makes for a lot of natural, nice light. And then uh, here in the kitchen, just off the kitchen, there is a, a washroom uh, that is accessible both from the dining room and the kitchen. We couldn't really figure why they did that, but uh, we think it was probably to access the pool that was in the backyard. This door goes out onto the deck, and as you've seen from the aerial photos, the deck runs the full length of the building. Then when you come this way, uh, again, the commercial gas stove is there. One thing we were surprised about is the three fri fridge freezers. There's two all fridges and one all freezer. And uh, it has worked really good for functions, which we did have before the lockdowns in January. And uh, it works so good. A bit of a coffee bar there. And from there, we're back in the living room. And uh, now we're going to take you down to the other end of the hall. Boy, we almost forgot the uh, master bedroom and uh, forgot to show you this. So just come on in. Um, again, this furniture was all left uh, by the previous owner. And we are kind of feel spoiled to, to have uh, such a lovely room. But uh, all this, the bed and the dressers and everything were left behind. Uh, off the master, there is a, a walk, large walk-in closet. We don't really have uh, enough clothes to fill all the, the hangers. This Sharon, Sharon uses this spot for a bit of a prayer room. And uh, then the bathroom was totally redone and uh, includes actually a steam shower and um, just beyond anything we could have imagined. But uh, yeah, we are quite amazed at what God has done. Okay, we're back at the front entry now, and uh, I'm just going to show you this room here. It's actually uh, was a guest room, and we have been using it for my mother-in-law's suite. And it's got a bathroom and uh, a fairly large bedroom. And it wor has worked out just amazing to be able to care for uh, Sharon's mother. So we're very thankful to be able to do that. From this room, we're going to take you uh, down to a couple more offices uh, just down the hall. There's another doorway here that you pass through. This office is Sharon's office. And she, uh, she never really had anything like this for an office. She worked in one of the smallest bedrooms in our home for everything that she did. So uh, this has been really nice, very, very nice to have the, the windows and the natural lighting. And uh, so she does all her writing for Club DJ here, as well as the bookkeeping that she does for David and Jonathan. This next office is Levi's office. And uh, he, uh, he actually just finished building a custom desk to go along that whole, uh, that whole wall. He's got sound boards up there for when he's doing sound recording. And he, Levi's done a lot of the printing, uh, both for the Spanish printing as well as Club DJ printing for uh, uh, across Canada. So uh, he, a lot of work happens in this room. So the last big room is one that kind of took us by surprise. We, uh, we walked in and uh, it wasn't quite like this. There was somebody actually living in this room. Uh, she had a uh, couch and fridge and stove and everything in here. But when we came in here, we thought this will be perfect for training, for even dessert nights. And uh, we, we just couldn't believe it that the property had a room like this. She, has got the put plywood floor down, but there is a little bit of work we need to do. We want to put in carpet tile and, and paint the room, and, and we got to do a little bit of work with the lighting. 
But you can see already how this is working like some of the banquet uh, places we've been. There's, there's seating in here right now for 80, and we could probably get upwards to 100 people in here comfortably for a meal. And so uh, we are pretty amazed what God has done. The chairs that you're seeing, these burgundy chairs, we bought for $5 a chair. Uh, and the uh, tables we found at uh, the Habitat for Humanity store, and we got uh, these eight six-foot tables for, I think it was $700. So that gives you a bit of an idea of what the main floor looks like and uh, just the potential for what God has done here. And I trust you're encouraged, and we look forward to showing you both the upper level next week and the lower level the week after that. Thank you for uh, joining us on the tour, and God bless. We trust you've been encouraged as we've shared how God has been at work and continues to work even amidst these difficult days. If you would like more information on the different ministry opportunities you've heard about today, you can call or email us and we'd love to answer any questions you might have. If you'd like to give financially to any of our three ministries, Child Evangelism Fellowship of Saskatchewan, Child Evangelism Fellowship of Alberta, or you be David and I'll be Jonathan, you can call the number on your screen. You can also donate online by visiting one of our websites. Or you can write to us. Our address is P.O. Box 236, Sedley, Saskatchewan, S0G 4K0. We hope you'll join us again next week at 6.45 p.m. on April 11th for our next program in our four-part series as we continue to share how God has been at work through our various ministries. Thank you for joining us and may God bless you.